Welcome to our channel, where we explore life at the molecular level. In this video, we delve into the oral physiology, the crucial first step in digestion. Have you ever wondered how our body obtains energy in atoms? It may surprise you to learn that we get them by eating other cells. However, to extract their inner energy-rich molecules, we must break them apart into little molecules that our cells can absorb. This physiological process is known as digestion and is carried out by our digestive system. Let's take a closer look at the fascinating molecular processes involved in digestion, starting with the first step, mastication. Entry to the digestive tract is through the mouth or oral cavity. This area is formed by the muscular lips, which help procure, guide, and contain the food in the mouth. Once the food is in the mouth, mastication begins, the process of chewing, slicing, tearing, grinding, and mixing the ingested food using the teeth. The teeth are firmly embedded in and protrude from the jawbones, the exposed part of a tooth is covered by enamel, the hardest structure of the body. The structure of enamel is amazing, as it's made from enamel rods, keyhole-shaped rods that interlock perfectly to create a mosaic pattern. Their atomic structure is made from hydroxyapatite crystals made out of molecular sheets of calcium ions and phosphorus stacked vertically in a symmetrical pattern. As the food is being chewed in the mouth, it's mixed with saliva, an extracellular fluid composed of 99% water and 1% electrolytes, mucus, and proteins. The mucus in saliva is extremely effective in binding chewed food into a slippery bolus that glides easily down the esophagus without damaging the mucosa. Saliva also solubilizes dry food so that they can be tasted by the tongue, it contains the major taste buds in the oral cavity, which contains the cells that detect molecules from the food. These cells form clusters of 50 to 100 columnar cells resembling a garlic bulb, and serve as checkpoints for quality control, distinguishing between pleasant and unpleasant tastes. Most poisons, for example, taste bitter, while off food tastes sour, and energy-rich foods taste sweet or umami. Taste buds are classified into three different types. About half of the total number of cells in a taste bud are type 1 cells, which have glial-like functions, expressing enzymes and transporters that eliminate extracellular neurotransmitters. Approximately one-third of the cells in a taste bud are type 2 cells, which are larger in diameter and function as chemosensory receptors for sugars, amino acids, ions and bitter stimuli. Type 2 cells respond to one taste quality, such as sweet or bitter but not both. Type 3 taste cells are the least numerous and represent 2 to 20% of the cells in a taste bud. These cells sense sour tastes and also respond secondarily to other taste stimuli via cell-to-cell -cell paracrine communication within the taste bud. When you take a bite of those spicy beef tacos, the amino acids in the meat bind with receptors on the cell membrane of taste bud cells. This causes the intracellular part of the receptor to change shape, attracting and binding with G-proteins, inducing G-proteins to exchange a GDP ligand for an GTP molecule, which causes the separation of their alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. The alpha subunit of the G-protein then activates phospholipase C-proteins, which contain an enzyme that takes phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate molecules from the membrane and hydrolyzes their inositol part, releasing dozens of inositol molecules into the cytoplasm. These inositol molecules serve as ligands to inositol-dependent calcium channels in the endoplasmic reticulum, inducing them to open and release calcium ions into the cytoplasm. Calcium ions serve as a ligand to sodium channels in cell membranes, inducing the release of sodium into the extracellular space, causing a reversal in membrane polarity, and initiating an action potential that spreads through the whole cell membrane. The change in membrane voltage causes non-selective ion channels to open, releasing ATP as a neurotransmitter at a synapse with an efferent neuron. ADP serves as a ligand that opens ion channels called P2X, causing depolarization of the membrane in the taste nerve and initiating action potentials that travel down the efferent neuron of the taste nerve. 
The taste signal is transmitted by the glossopharyngeal nerve to neurons located in the nucleus of the solitary tract. Once there, the signals are relayed to the salivatory nucleus, which processes information from various sources. The salivatory nucleus subsequently transmits a signal through sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves to enhance saliva production and saliva proteins on acinar cells. Saliva is largely produced by three major pairs of salivary glands that lie outside the oral cavity and discharge saliva through short ducts into the mouth. If we zoom in on the parotid gland, we can see that it resembles a cluster of grapes. It's composed of hundreds of tiny lobes called acinus that produce saliva, which are connected by a duct that collects the saliva produced. Acini are composed of two different kinds of cells, serous acinar cells, which secrete proteins in a solution with a high concentration of ions known as isotonic water, and mucous acinar cells, which secrete mucin proteins, giving saliva its viscous and sticky characteristics. The acini can be composed of serous cells, mucous cells, or a mixture of both. The secretory acinus lobes merge into intercalated ducts, which are lined by a simple low cuboidal epithelium and are surrounded by myoepithelial cells. These ducts continue as striated ducts and have a folded basal membrane to enable active transport and enhance the absorption of ions. The striated ducts lead into interlobular excretory ducts, which are lined with a tall columnar epithelium. To produce saliva, Cells utilize a specific mechanism to transport water from the capillaries to the core of the acini. However, controlling the movement of water is not a simple process as there is no protein capable of actively pumping water across the cell membrane. Water enters and leaves the cell through specialized proteins called aquaporins, which act as channels facilitating the free passage of water. In order to control the movement of water, Cells adjust their water potential by altering the ion concentration both inside and outside the cell. To extract water from the capillaries, acinar cells uphold a higher intracellular concentration of chloride ions in comparison to its basolateral side, elevating the water potential within the cell, and when the acinar cells open chloride channels on their apical side, chloride ions are discharged into the salivary ducts, drawing water into the salivary ducts. To build up a high concentration of chloride ions the acinar cells possess chloride cotransporters that utilizes the electrochemical potential energy of sodium and potassium ions to transport chloride ions against their electrochemical gradient. This cotransporter introduces two chloride ions for every sodium and potassium ion. The energy required for this process is derived from the electrochemical potential provided by the sodium-potassium pump, which utilizes the chemical energy of ATP to sustain it. Another kind of chloride cotransporter utilizes the electrochemical potential of ionized bicarbonate to transport chloride ions into the cell. The bicarbonate concentration is maintained by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase which facilitates the rapid interconversion of carbon dioxide and water into bicarbonate ions, which serves as an electrochemical force that aids in the transport of chloride ions. To release chloride ions through the apical side of the cell is a slightly more complex process, as it is regulated by parasympathetic neurons that establish synapses with acinar cells. These neurons release acetylcholine, which acts as a ligand on muscarinic receptors, activating G proteins. The activation of the inositol 3-phosphate signaling pathway is subsequently triggered, leading to the release of calcium ions. The calcium ions, in turn, open chloride channels on the apical membrane of the cell, thereby regulating saliva production. The production of salivary proteins is also regulated by the nervous system. Acinar cells establish synapses with sympathetic neurons that release adrenaline. Adrenaline acts as a ligand on adrenergic receptors, which in turn activate a specific type of G protein. This activated G protein initiates the cyclic AMP signaling pathway, leading to the activation of PKA, a kinase responsible for activating motor proteins involved in vesicle transport. When the vesicles reach the cell membrane, they undergo fusion, releasing the salivary proteins into the salivary ducts, such as mucins, amylases, defensins, cystatins, 
histidins, lactoperoxidases, lysozymes, lactoferins, and immunoglobulins. Some of them begin digestion by breaking down monomers of polysaccharides, others function as biological weapons against bacteria, viruses, and fungi, and others serve to lubricate food. Newly produced saliva contains a high concentration of ions. To prevent ion wastage, cells in the intercalated ducts passively absorb these ions by utilizing sodium and chloride channels located in their apical and basal membranes. The ions move from areas of high concentration to low concentration naturally. However, to ensure the collection of all the remaining ions present in isotonic saliva, striated duct cells employ chloride bicarbonate cotransporters. These transporters facilitate the movement of ions from areas of lower concentration to higher concentration, resulting in saliva becoming a hypotonic solution. When you indulge in something delicious like tacos, it is common for overstimulation to occur. In such situations, the parasympathetic neurons are activated and stimulate the myoepithelial cells surrounding the acini and striated ducts. These cells contract, causing a rapid expulsion of saliva from the salivary ducts. The saliva is released so quickly that there is insufficient time for the absorption of chlorine ions, resulting in the saliva being expelled in its isotonic form. However, these chlorine ions are not wasted since they eventually reach the stomach where they play a role in the production of hydrochloric acid. After mastication and lubrication with saliva, the soft portion of the roof of the mouth, soft palate, rises so that the passageway between the nasal and oral cavities is closed off. The tongue rolls backward, propelling food into the oral pharynx, a chamber behind the mouth that functions to transport food and air. Once food enters the pharynx, the second stage of swallowing begins. Respiration is temporarily inhibited as the larynx, or voice box, rises to close the glottis, the opening to the air passage. Pressure within the mouth and pharynx pushes food toward the esophagus. At the beginning of the esophagus there is a muscular constrictor, the upper esophageal sphincter, which relaxes and opens when food approaches. Food passes from the pharynx into the esophagus, the upper esophageal sphincter then immediately closes, preventing flow of food back into the mouth. Once food is in the esophagus, the final phase of swallowing begins. The larynx lowers, the glottis opens, and breathing resumes. From the time food leaves the mouth until it passes the upper sphincter, only about one second of time elapses, during which all these body mechanisms spontaneously occur. After passing the upper sphincter, movements in the esophagus carry food to the stomach. Rhythmic muscular contractions, peristaltic waves, and pressure within the esophagus push the food downward. Folds in the esophageal wall stretch out as materials pass by them and again contract once they have passed. At the lower end of the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes and food enters the stomach, the sphincter then closes again to prevent reflux of gastric juices and food materials. Swallowing is basically an involuntary reflex, one cannot swallow unless there is saliva or some substance to be swallowed. Initially, food is voluntarily moved to the rear of the oral cavity, but once food reaches the back of the mouth, the reflex to swallow takes over and cannot be retracted. If you enjoyed this video and found the physiology of mastication intriguing, be sure to show your support by giving it a like and subscribing to our channel. By subscribing, you won't miss out on our upcoming video where we delve into the fascinating physiology of the stomach. Join our community of curious learners and stay connected as we continue our journey through the wonders of the human body. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.